So uh, don't worry, it's Ramadan time, but I've been told it's not a fasting symposium, so there will still be food being distributed during the talks. Um, I'm going to talk about non-invasive monitoring and some of the options that are out there. Um, these are the disclosure of my conflict of interest in terms of, of collaboration of research that I've done uh, with some of these companies. And a lot of the information that I will try to pass over the next 15 minutes or so, you can actually find in this consensus and circulatory shock that we published with the European Society uh, of Intensive Care Medicine uh, three years ago. It's free to be downloaded. It's open access in intensive care medicine. And uh, some other information you can find also on this uh, position paper from the cardiovascular dynamic section of the European Society of Intensive Care again, which again you can find in intensive care medicine. And in this paper we have uh, really tried to summarize some of the evidence around uh, what are the options there to monitor cardiac output, to monitor cardiac function in our patient, and also to try to give some take-home messages on how we can select the devices, sometimes based on the level of invasiveness and many times on the variable that we want maybe to look at and on the setting of patients and maybe sometimes on the same patients in different phases of the pathology. But it's very important to remember, and this is something that we already said over the last two days, that uh, there is no monitor that is going to be useful just if we target an absolute value of cardiac output. That's a nonsense. Uh, what we do really is try to optimize the hemodynamics of our patients. And first of all, we need to go back to, to basics. With our clinical examination to identify those patients that are unstable. And uh, we heard a lot about arterial blood pressure uh, this morning. And let's remember that hypotension is still a very important uh, uh, factor to recognize in our patient. A patient that presents to the emergency department with a de novo hypotension is in danger. Let's treat that as an emergency. Even patients that have just one episode of hypotension that, get, that gets resolved and those patients go to the ward, we do know that they are associated with significantly high mortality. Just one episode that is treated, this patient then go back to the ward, while these patients still have probably reached for a point, a level of decompensation, which probably is the reason why they are a sick patient. Maybe we should monitor, maybe we should take to our unit. Uh, a bit earlier. And as we said yesterday, uh, it's really important always to think about the interaction between vasoplegia and hypoperfusion. There was a question uh, this morning and uh, one of the delegates was correctly asking, we still see patients in our unit that come with uh, a low lactate uh, but a very low blood pressure. For me, that patient is still in shock. I agree with you. Uh, those are patients that clearly are decompensated in in that moment, and even if the lactate is not very high, we know that despite having a low lactate, if those patients have significant hypotension, they are still associated with a very high mortality. Two out of 10 of those patients will die. But it's really when we combine hypoperfusion, hyperlactatemia, and hypotension that we see that the, uh, the cohort of patients become really sicker. And those group of patients that had uh, hypotension with very high lactate, these are really those patients in which we do need to get extra information, I think, to really understand what we do when we give fluids. If the fluids are not enough to rise the blood pressure and to drop that lactate, do we need to start with an inot? Do we need to start to think about a slightly different strategy? We heard about the CVP in a fantastic pro-con uh, debate just an hour ago. Uh, the truth is that despite the CVP having so many limitations and the fact that we here should not be used to target our fluid management still at the bedside in 2015 at least we know that the CVP is still the most commonly used variable. This is what we found in Fenice and uh, the data was actually a bit surprising because we thought that some of the messages probably were out there and, and using really absolute values of CVP. It's really a nonsense. How do I look at the CVP? Um, I was not part of the PROCON debate but I also have my views around the CVP, and I think what uh, Dr. Marek and Dr. Magder uh, summarized is the fact that using absolute values of CVP doesn't make any sense, but if we couple cardiac output or stroke volume measurements together with what happened with the CVP, 
as Michael Pinsky was saying, then the CVP maybe can serve as a stopping rule, at least can serve us as an idea of what's going on with the venture calls when we try to stress the system by increasing intravascular volume. So what do I do in my practice? Well, I do like in uh, sick patients to measure cardiac function, and you can do this with echocardiography or uh, cardiac output monitors, invasive or less invasive. And if I have a patient that is sick, usually that patient will be uh, already on a noradrenaline infusion, we will have a central line. If I have a central line, I do like to measure the CVP and see what happened with a dynamic assessment of the circulation. So I can have a poor uh, function in ventricle, for instance, with uh, the corresponding CVP uh, preload curve, and I could have maybe a good function in ventricle with, again, the corresponding CVP preload curve. Now let's imagine we've received these patients from the emergency departments and they both receive 30 milliliters per kilogram, whether we agree with that or not. But now I've decided I want to fine tune what I'm doing. I do want to understand if extra fluids can help or maybe if I should think about an extra strategy, if maybe I should just sit tight and wait and see what happened to these patients. Now, what we heard this morning is also that the CVP is affected by so many variables the vascular tone, the intrathoracic pressure, how this pressure is transmitted. So I could really move this curve here to the top, to the right, left, to the bottom, that we still make sense. And these values, I deliberately put it here on a similar uh, value of CVP. Now, let's challenge the circulation with a fluid challenge. We've decided that we want to see if maybe extra fluids can help. So uh, in my unit, we give about four milliliters per kilogram, so for a 70 kilo men, that's about uh, a fluid challenge of 250 uh, milliliters, really roughly. So uh, what we do, we give a fluid challenge and we look at the cardiac function. Now, if I look at the cardiac function and I see that there is no increase in stroke volume and in cardiac output, and at the same time, there is a significant increase in the CVP, this is a patient that is not tolerating fluids. I should stop giving fluids here. When I see this rise in CVP, with no changes in stroke volume and cardiac output, I should stop giving fluids because that is telling me that the patient is really not coping well with an increase in the, intra, uh, in the intravascular volume. He's not able really to pump forward the venous return. On the other hand, if I am on the ascending part of the Frank Starling curve and I see an increase in stroke volume and cardiac output with my monitor, and at the same time, no increase in the CVP, of a very small increase in the CVP, that is a suggestion that that patient is really coping, is able to accommodate extra fluids, and that extra fluid is successful in increasing stroke volume and cardiac output. So for me, it's obvious that if I look at the delta changes in CVP, they were never meant to mean anything in terms of changes in stroke volume and cardiac output. That's what physiology is telling us. So it's not a surprise that we had many papers showing that if we look at the absolute values of CVP or changes in CVP, whether this should correlate for any reason with changes in stroke volume and cardiac output. So uh, this is one of the papers from Dr. Marek, again, an updated meta-analysis that just shows it's a nonsense uh, to use the CVP in this way. But again, if we look at the physiology, I think it is an important variable that if we couple with an assessment of cardiovascular function, can give us important information. We tried to put this into this editorial in which we basically were saying, let's not throw out the CVP, that physiology is still there. If we don't know how to use it, maybe we should invest on some education and training for our teams rather than throwing away a tool that can still be very useful. Now, what do we use to uh, guide our therapy? Well, from Fenice, we found that actually uh, clinicians really are driven by what happens in terms of blood pressure. If there is hypotension, we give fluids. If there is hypotension, we get worried. If there is a, a hypotension, we're trying to do some sort of hemodynamic intervention. And now do we assess the response to fluids? Again, with blood pressure. So blood pressure is what is used in about 70% in uh, the fluid challenges. Interestingly, even uh, urine output was used to assess the response uh, to a fluid challenge. This is a complete nonsense uh, to give a fluid bolus and to expect that the urine output that dropped by 20 milliliters in the previous hour will rise, and that's a good marker of a response, it's really it's a nonsense. A urine output that increases because we're giving fluids could just be the marker that maybe we're overloading our patient with fluids. It doesn't have anything to do with the cardiovascular function. We hear that actually by increasing the venous congestion, we can make the uh, 
renal function worse, so I really don't think we should lose this. And uh, interesting enough, decreasing heart rate, uh, I would agree with this if I give uh, a fluid bolus and we see the heart rate dropping. Of course, that usually something has happened to the cardiac output, to the stroke volume uh, of the patient. And surprisingly, again, changes in CVP were used to evaluate the response to fluids, which maybe if they were used as a stopping rule, uh, it is something that will have uh, some physiological meaning. But why shouldn't we be using uh, arterial blood pressure alone to look at changes in uh, flow when we give a fluid challenge? Well, it is not true that we should never look at blood pressure. If I give a fluid challenge and the blood pressure increases, I don't need fancy monitors there to understand what happens. Of course, that patient is responding probably with an increase in cardiac output and is maintaining tone and the blood pressure is going up. But we know that that's not often the case. We know that about 50% of patients will not uh, increase their cardiac output and we know that about 50% of the 50% of patients that increase cardiac output may not change their blood pressure. So that means that if we just look at blood pressure, we may miss about half of the patient that can benefit from fluids. And indeed, if we look at correlation from arterial blood pressure in states of shock and cardiac output when I give fluids, it's really it's a scattergram. There is no correlation here whatsoever between changes in mean arterial pressure and changes in cardiac output. So what can we do to get some extra information? Well, we have a lot of devices available there now. I do believe that echocardiography needs to become our stethoscope now. Uh, the same thing that was uh, 30, 40 years ago. Some basic understanding of echocardiography for all of us that work in intensive care needs to be there. Um, we don't have to be all echo experts, but we all need to be able to recognize some basic abnormalities like hypovolemia, right ventricular strain, whether there is a pericardial infusion. Those things are actually easy to learn. It's not something for which we need years and years of training. And that it's a very powerful information is something that actually with our consensus we advocated, it should really be the first line when we want to understand what's going on with a patient in shock that is not responding to the initial therapy. It can give us some idea of the diagnosis. In some units, if you have the possibilities, maybe you can also use this for continuous monitoring uh, your patients. In my unit, uh, I do have 21 patients when I'm on call to look after. I cannot really go around every one of these patients and do an echo every five minutes. I can go and do a point of care ultrasound when needed, but then I would still like to guide my therapy and maybe to put a continuous cardiac output monitor there. Often I am asked, uh, how do you choose and uh, what is the best monitor that you use in Europe? And I don't really have an answer for that because it really depends on where you work. It depends on the type of patients that you treat. It depends on what you want to do with the information on that monitor. And I like to think about cardiac output, a perfect cardiac output monitor, as a monitor that will always be very accurate, which means that the absolute value that the monitor gives me is very, very close to the real value of cardiac output, and very precise, which means that if I take the measurement and repeat the measurement, again, will be very, very close. So the standard deviation between measurements will be very narrow which means usually that if the real cardiac output of the patient changes, then the monitor will be able to track these changes in a precise way. Now, I can tolerate in some situations maybe to have a monitor that is accurate and not so precise. Funny enough, we were talking this morning about uh, the intermittent thermodilution of the pulmonary artery catheter, and Michael was saying it's not really a gold standard, maybe it's a bronze standard. Um, it's what we consider our standard in practice for many years, but it was affected by some problems in terms of precision. When you take one measurement, due to the respiratory cycle effect, but also due to some inherent imprecision in the device, we knew for the ones that they use this technique that we were not taking one measurement only. What we were doing, we were taking three to four measurements and we were taking the average of that. And that's a way to try to get a more accurate uh, number there. I can do that if maybe what uh, my clinical question is in a patient with cardiogenic shock, is the cardiac output very low? I want to start an inotrope and maybe I want to take another snapshot a few hours later. That could be important information. But in the majority of what we do, I would argue that the most important thing is actually the fact that we can track changes during our challenges, whether we do that with fluids or with vasoactive drugs, and we want to track these fast changes in a very precise way. Of course, what we don't want 
is a device that is just a random number generator. And the, uh, uh, the accuracy is not there and the precision is not there. But I do think that there are some opportunities where the absolute value of cardiac couple may not be perfect, in which we can still use less invasive devices as long as they are precise. And where is that part of the physiology that we can measure? I think that when we give uh, fluids, or all the chapter of fluid responsiveness, it's more about precision, it's more about trending, rather than about absolute values of cardiac output and stroke volume. For instance, if I want to give a fluid challenge and I want to see if I am on the ascending part of the frame styling curve, if I'm approaching the plateau part of the frame styling curve, I really don't care too much whether my starting stroke volume is 30, 40, or 60. I've decided in my mind already that the patient has got a problem with perfusion. I want to see if a manipulation of cardiac output can get those things better. It doesn't really matter too much what absolute value the stroke volume is. But I do want to know that if I give a free challenge, I'm using a device that is tracking the change in the right direction. And maybe, again, the absolute values at the end will be different, but the trending will be exactly in the same direction. And for the same reasons, when we looked at heart-lung interactions and systolic pressure variation, pulse pressure variation, or stroke volume variation. If you look at the way these numbers are calculated, they basically, we have a ratio between one scale and another scale, which means that the absolute value is not so important. We are taking away the unit of measure here, and what we are left is a percentage. So when I'm left with a percentage, again, the trending and the precision ability of the device over time is more important than the absolute value the device is measuring there. And the same thing if I am challenging the circulation maybe with a passive leg raising. Again, I want to see if by creating this autologous uh, bolus of fluid, which would be very transient, if I can detect a change in cardiac output during this maneuver, then I know that I'm predicting that if I give fluids afterwards, then the patient will increase the cardiac output and the stroke volume. But what is common in all of these maneuvers that we are doing? The common thing is that we do want to measure a change in stroke volume and this changing stroke volume has to be measured in a very fast way. I was showing you yesterday, for instance, that the maximum change after a fluid challenge occurs about a minute after a fluid challenge. And during a passive leg raising, the changes are even faster than that. If I was using a pulmonary artery catheter, for instance, which maybe is still the most accurate device that we have there, I will not be able to detect these fast changes when I give a small bolus of fluid, when I do a passive leg raising, or, for instance, when I want to look at heart-lung interaction. So continuous fast uh, data acquisition is really important to uh, be looked at when we looked at these devices. And, of course, we need to use them in the right context, and we need to have a group of patients in which these devices are validated for the type of measurement that we are taking. Now, the fact that we are measuring something doesn't necessarily mean that we get things better. Uh, for instance, this was a study by the group of Takala in which they randomized a patient to receive either a, a non-invasive cardiac output monitor or nothing, but there was no protocol there. We were just randomizing this patient to have or not to have a monitor. The practice didn't really change at the bedside, and what they found, there was absolutely no difference in the outcomes. But I, I'm not so surprised. Also, they didn't control for the timing of admission to the intensive care. This patient could have been in shock for many hours, sometimes for days. Um, it could also be, of course, that maybe the monitor was not giving reliable information, but I would argue that the important thing to remember is we have a narrow window to get these patients better. They are in an emergency. We need to get them right, really, in the first hours, and we need to use this device to change our uh, therapy. If what we're using is just a monitor that is just reassuring us that what we were doing before is okay, there's no point of using any of these devices. And of course, sometimes it may be that we are choosing the wrong protocols or we are using the wrong approaches to treat these patients. Uh, this is a, an interesting study that was published in intensive care medicine a couple of years ago, in which with a volumetric monitoring, they uh, randomized patients to have a volumetric guided treatment or a treatment guided by CVP. And for the whole stay of these patients, whether they were in septic shock or in, uh, with uh, ARDS, they basically kept this patient always with an intrathoracic blood volume of 850 with an extravascular along water uh, below 10, and the CVP was always kept between 8 to 12. That's not how I treat my patients. 
I would treat my patient with very different targets, very different uh, physiological endpoints if they are in the first hour of shock or if they are six hours after destabilization. Trying to achieve fluid unresponsiveness, maybe it's an okay target in the first two hours when we get a patient that is very sick. But when we have achieved some stabilization, it's not physiological to be on the proto part of the Fenstarling curve. So I don't know if this was a problem with the monitor, but certainly this is not a physiological approach to hemodynamic monitoring. In hemodynamic monitoring, we have to try to get the information, but the situation is very dynamic and we need to recognize these dynamic changes in our patients. And indeed, if we fail to do so, we may even cause harm in some patients. Again, I don't think there's nothing wrong with the device that is used, but that we have serious concern about the type of protocol that was used in these patients. If on the other hand, we looked at a, a more homogeneous group of patients in which we have a very well-defined endpoint, which is, for instance, the chapter of goal-directed therapy in high-risk surgery, where we see actually that using consistently for a very short period of time these devices can give us some advantages, and advantages that are reflected in decrease in complication for very different mortality risk groups. So even for mortality risk groups of less than 5%, still we see a benefit in using this approach in a very well-defined group of patients. So how to choose? Um, difficult to go through uh, every single detail of every device there, but I invite you to read uh, our uh, review on the subject in which we try to give some basic uh, principles on how devices could be selected and maybe sometimes escalated from one device to the other on the same patient and escalated and so on. And to stay in time, I'm going to conclude uh, to say, I think the optimization of the hemodynamics can be done with less invasive techniques. Uh, let's remember the goal is always perfusion. Uh, let's remember that sometimes being less invasive is not possible, but it's really important what we do to the device more than the device itself. Uh, and let's recognize the limitation of the techniques. Let's remember the context of uh, and, uh, and the differences between accuracy and precision because that's a very different way to use the same information from the devices. And really let's remember protocols and what we do with this information. It's more important than any monitor we can put there. Thank you. Thank you very much.